Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Paulo Tenani, and I'm a professor at the São Paulo School of Economics at Fundação Getúlio Vargas and head of research at Aqua Wealth Management. Uh, this is the sixth edition of Humus da América Latina, an event in honor of Professor Werner Bayer, and which annually discusses relevant issues for the region. Uh, the topic of this year's event will be Latin America, what kind of recovery? And it's a par partnership between the Sao Paulo School of Economics at Fundação Getúlio Vargas, the Cromer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College, and Aqua Wealth Management. I would like to thank everyone who is watching us on the YouTube and LinkedIn channels of Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Well, by now, uh, the global economy has successfully recovered from the COVID-19 shock. Global real GDP is expected to be fully recovered by the end of 2021, pushed up by emerging Asia, whose real GDP will have increased by 6% compared to its pre-COVID level. Developed countries' real GDP are by now mostly unaltered, whereas Latin American GDP will still be 1.2%, below its 2019 level. Not such a brilliant performance, but much better than what had been previously expected. Within the region, and in terms of real GDP, Chile has had the best performance and is expected to close 2021 with a real GDP that will be 3.3% above its pre-COVID level. Brazil and Colombia come second and third with real GDPs basically unaltered, a performance that is equivalent to the success stories of the most developed countries. However, all other countries in the region have GDPs that are still below their pre-COVID levels. Peru, 1.9% below, Mexico, 3% below, Argentina, 3.2% below, Ecuador, 5.4% below, and the tragic story being, once again, Venezuela that suffered a drastic reduction in real GDP and may take a decade to recover. While there are still uncertainties about the recovery, there is also a bright spot for the region. It comes from commodity prices, which are highly correlated with Latin American growth. Uh, the Global Commodity Index is expected to close 2021 up by 25% from its pre-COVID level, pushed up by industrial metals, up 35%, oil, up 27%, and agricultural prices, up 12%. In terms of commodity prices, it seems, the international scenario is highly benevolent to Latin America. However, despite the better than expected recovery from the COVID crisis, as well as higher commodity prices, international financial markets have been relentless in pricing Latin American assets. For instance, the MSCI Latin American index is down by 28% from its pre-COVID level, whereas the world index is up 40%, and the G7 index is up by 36%. This is an excess performance of close to seven percentage points that global equities have over Latin American equities. And an excess performance of such a magnitude has only been seen during major economic crises for the region, which at this point have not yet happened. In addition, two of the Latin American countries that had totally recovered from the COVID-19 shock, Brazil and Colombia, an exceptional performance close to that performance of the developed countries have faced the steepest, steepest declines in asset prices, with Brazilian equities down by 40% and Colombian equities by 30%. What do explain such ex extraordinary underperformance of Latin American assets? Are financial markets pricing some sort of extreme event negative? Uh, or markets are just overreacting. The objective of this event is to shed some light into these questions, and I hope that it will meet uh, this objective. Before giving the floor to my friend Eduardo Goldzal, who will moderate the debate, I want to clarify that the opinions expressed in this event 
are the, uh, are uh, are not uh, are the responsibility of each of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the opinion of Fundação Getúlio Vargas. In addition, all the speakers in this event agreed to participate of their own free will and consented to be recorded in this broadcast, which will be later uh, be posted on Fundação <laughs> Getúlio Vargas official channels. I now give the floor to Eduardo Goldsau to introduce the other participants and lead the discussion. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Paulo. I'll be very brief about this introduction. I would just like to say that there is a, a common element or a common denominator for all the speakers today at this panel. We have all benefited from the teachings of Professor Rene Baer, who was not only an outstanding professor at University of Illinois, but a friend of his students. It was not uncommon for Wayne Bear to have more than 20 students under his umbrella, lots of them from Brazil, others from other places in Latin America, some from Portugal, but he had a, a large number of students under his supervision. And a, lot, and a lot of them had financial aid or some sort of support, including myself. So uh, that, that was a, a big deal for us. At Wenner, he left uh, Germany as a young boy fleeing the Second World War. His family settled in New York City and Banner went on to School of Economics. He, he got his uh, PhD from, from Harvard. Uh, there were a lot of things accomplished by, by Weiner, but I should uh, mention one in particular, uh, his book called The Brazilian Economy, Growth and Development is one of the most comprehensive studies in English of all aspects of Brazil economic development and is currently in, the, in its seventh edition. It seems like it was yesterday, but Professor Wayne Bear passed, <clears throat> passed away in March 2016. Well, let me go ahead and, and introduce all the speakers that will be debating today. Uh, in the order of appearance, the first speaker, uh, Dr. Dan Biller, is currently Professor of Economics of Cromer Graduate School of Business in Orlando, Florida. Dan worked for over 20 years at the World Bank in several capacities. He also worked at, for several years at the at OECD, now the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Dan has a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois. Followed by Dan will be Dr. John Welsh, who is currently CEO of Research for Emerging Markets, REM, Inc., and Executive Director of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce in New York City. Before coming to the chamber, John was managing and chief economist for Latin America and Brazil for HSBC. John also had similar positions at other banks, including Banco Itaú, Barclays Capital, and BNP Paribas, among others. John has a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois. Followed by John will be Dr. Paulo Tenani. I should mention that uh, Tenani is replacing uh, uh, Professor Antonio Nogueira Leite, who for uh, personal reasons could not attend today. And so Dr. Paulo Tenani, who we all, we all should know and you all know, is a professor of economics at Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Sao Paulo. Uh, prior to that, uh, Paulo was head of research at UBS Wealth Management and a strategist at Solomon Smith Barney Citigroup Asset Management. He also worked for Swiss Bank Corporation in New York. Paulo has a PhD in economics from Columbia and a master's degree from University of Illinois. I'm your host, uh, your uh, mod mod moderator. I'm currently the head partner of Mir Tax, which is a tax and transfer pricing consulting firm based in Miami. Uh, 
Prior to that, I was senior director at NCR Corporation in Atlanta. And before that, I had a long career at KPMG as a tax partner in Lisbon and in Miami. I have a PhD in economics from the New School in New York City and a master's from University of Illinois. Well, without further ado, I'll pass the word to our first speaker, Professor Dunn Diller. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, I will put my presentation on the screen and I will talk to some slides. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to address the participants of the sixth edition of the Humus the America Latina and Latin American Pathways and the second in partnership with Cromer School of Business at Rollins College, where I am uh, now. Today, I would like to present to you a bit of the US perspective of, of the economic recovery and how it, this could link to the Latin American economic recovery. I know people are often focused on the present and the maximum, uh, the near future. Most finance go government officials that I've worked with back in my career in the World Bank and OECD certainly didn't have time to, uh, to do much planning they are mostly trying to find ways to, of getting funding to fulfill promises given by pol politicians. Yet I think it is worthwhile to go look back in the past 20 years, especially since it includes the great recession of 2008 and from 2008 to 10 about, and see if there are some lessons or at least some points worth raising that could give us uh, some future perspectives. Essentially, I would like to go back to 2020, check what I mentioned in a few uh, webinars and conferences I participated back then, and look like what the future looked like back then and assess whether I was broadly on target. I would like to complete this exercise by looking at the future once again today. Of course, I do all of this always humbled by the famous physicist Niels Bohr, who said predictions is very difficult, especially if it is about the future. So COVID comes to us in uh, the US. Uh, um, so this is the, the presentation. Uh, we essentially are doing the introduction. We'll discuss how the future like, uh, was like before and where we are and where we're going. So essentially COVID came to us in the US uh, basically on the first quarter of 2020. And this sort of message was coming out on the media. Uh, big COVID waves, uh, but an even bigger recession wave looming behind. You see in the first, uh, first uh, cartoon, it's representing New Zealand. The second cartoon is representing Canada, but essentially um, this, this was also sort of feared in the US as well. Now, one cartoon that I, unfortunately I didn't keep, but uh, I thought it was very interesting, was a job interview happening in 2030. And this job interviewer was asking a young job seeker about his employment gap in 2020. And essentially, he was asking, what were you doing back in uh, 2020? And the answer was, I was washing my hands. So for the sake of clarity, it is important to have a common understanding of what sort of time horizons we're talking about here. And uh, the first two cartoons do not really refer to any time horizon, but the third one does. So uh, when I say short, short term or uh, yeah, short term, I'm basically thinking about one to three years. Medium term, I'm thinking about three to five years. And long term, I'm thinking about five to 15 or even longer term. So if we go back to 2020, what sort of, of 
visions did we see back then? So back in uh, 2020, I was already very concerned about inflation, both for the short term and uh, medium term. And as a matter of fact, I raised that in the, the homes of last year. And I was also very concerned about um, the moral hazard that we put ourselves back in 2008. And I will explain this later, what I mean by that. I was also extremely concerned by the issues related to labor productivity and to a lesser extent income inequality, but primarily the inequality uh, of access and opportunity. To a bit lesser extent, there was a lot of talk about, about, uh, about uh, global trade. I was less uh, concerned about global trade. Um, sorry, a bit lesser extent, I was uh, concerned about environmental issues, more for the long term. And environmental issues is a little bit more complicated because you have to unpack uh, all the things that we put under environmental issues. Very often with, uh, we nowadays talk about environmental issues uh, referring to climate change, but in effect is a lot more than climate change. Now, it is a concern that generally populates in my mind, the medium term and the long term, except to very few countries. Um, but I was less concerned about uh, the impacts on trade and urbanization. Um, mainly, I remember very well that people were saying that trade dependency was too high and basically you have to, to erect trade barriers and so on. I think that it's very difficult to find economists that support this sort of view. And the cities were essentially emptying, which was uh, an impact that happened, for example, in New York City uh, and some other large cities, those that could, they would move to, 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 um, to the mountains and so on. This happened uh, back, uh, way back in the Great Plague as well, but the pull of agglomerations in cities is so huge that I didn't think that this would be uh, a real problem in the future. So let's look a little bit uh, on the data to justify a little bit of what we're talking about. Essentially, uh, the US had uh, three recessions in the course of this past 20 years. Uh, we're talking about the 9-11 uh, recession around 2001 that is not shown in this graph. Uh, you see the great recession of 2008 and let's say quote unquote, the COVID recession uh, which we're talking about now, and this is all um, uh, essentially bouncing back in um, very relatively quickly. So the Great Recession of 2008 was a major event and it lasted for, for a while. And if we recall back in the Great Recession, we used to talk about the ninja loans, uh, no income, no job, no assets approved or something like this. Uh, yet those who extended these ninja loans uh, and assumed greater risks for greater rewards didn't really impact, uh, were, were not really impacted by this bad choice. They didn't go bankrupt, for example, or not, at least not many of them. Um, society essentially bailed them out with the different stimulus packages, quite large at that time. In fact, uh, the largest at that time, 2008, in terms of even percentage of the US GDP. Um, the message seems to, to have been sent to society is basically take risks, keep the returns when the economy is good and society will bail you out when the economy is bad. So at that time when we were discussing uh, the issue at the World Bank, I raised this problem of moral hazards very often. There was not a lot of interest. They all became Cajuns, so to speak, and, and, and were, were discussing the stimulus packages, not so much of what was in the stimulus packages. Um, and I raised that I wouldn't be surprised if 10 to 15 years from 2008, we would find ourselves in the same pickle. Now, of course, I had no idea that COVID would come, but this moral hazard issue uh, 
uh, is a problem that's still permeating in the economy today, in my point of view. So here I want to, to look a little bit more in detail what I'm talking about, right? So what I presented to you is essentially U.S. inflation measured in uh, consumer price index. Uh, this is the green line. Uh, the unemployment uh, and the, the unemployment, the monthly unemployment rate, and then no cyclical rate of unemployment, the so-called non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Those are the different tones of brown. So the darker brown is the unemployment rate monthly, and the yellow is the, the non-cyclical rate of unemployment quarterly. Uh, inflation is monthly. You have also the effective uh, federal fund rate, which is daily, but I don't think that this matters that much, uh, which represents the monetary policy of the US. And finally, in red, you have the federal surplus or deficit as a percentage of the US uh, gross domestic product. And you know, I picked January as a, a good uh, benchmark to look at this, uh, to this, uh, this data. So essentially, um, what we see here is that back in January 2008, unemployment and the NIRU, the non-cyclical rate of unemployment, were about the same. So the output gap was practically zero. Inflation was running 4%. And the effective federal fund rate was 3.2%. And the the the, the um, uh, public deficit was already growing from before. When you get hit by the global recession, of course, what you see it's a situation of a very high unemployment rate of about uh, nine point eight percent back in uh, January down to ten. A huge output gap. Uh, your Nairo doesn't change very much, so it was around uh, 4.9. Inflation was low, uh, became lower, of course, and naturally the the Federal Reserve lowered uh, the federal fund rate. As expected, you would get the public deficit uh, increasing as a deficit as a percentage of the GDP. But what we see is that. As the unemployment began to decrease, the same thing happens with the federal deficit. It starts to move towards zero. And you have variations of that. The interest rate is still very low, the federal fund rates, but mainly inflation is within the target of the Federal Reserve. So the curiosity happens then in 2017. If you look at 2017, Unemployment, again, becomes uh, very similar to the non-cyclical rate of unemployment. Inflation is running around or close to, to the target. Um, the Federal Reserve then begins to increase the federal fund rate, which makes total sense. And that, that, uh, that let's say, um, thing of, of the federal deficit getting closer and closer to zero to a balanced budget begins to change, but not significantly. It begins to increase. We reach there with, uh, with a very similar uh, GDP uh, deficit, uh, deficit to GDP ratio of 2008. Now, in 2019, something happened. And that's why I put this story of the COVID recession in quotation marks, because in effect, in January 2019, the Federal uh, Reserve, which was essentially saying that it will increase interest rates, uh, reflecting then what the, the, the behavior of the economy, uh, said, okay, uh, in the beginning of 2019, uh, market, we will stop uh, at least for the end of the year, toward the end of 2019, we will stop um, increasing the federal fund rate. When it does, does that, you have the famous inversion of the yield curve, which is essentially the market believing that the Fed uh, sees foresees a recession 
in the near future. Now, I link this back again to a story in the World Bank where I was asked when the previous administration came in to give a sort of an economic view of what should be the previous administration, what would happen. And the way I felt was that there was a doubt on the trade story, but essentially on the fiscal side, it would be a spending administration. Uh, I, in fact, I compare it more or less to the Reagan administration of the 80s. And the expectation that I would have from that would be an increase on the uh, interest rates that is determined by the central bank, just like it happened back in the 80s. Well, this had got to, to a point, but then afterwards uh, it stopped. And that's we're talking about uh, early 2019. So my point here is that perhaps the COVID recession got worsened by COVID, but started actually before COVID. And of course, we get to, to, um, to January 2020, uh, the, the, uh, the unemployment is still doing well, but soon is going to shoot up like crazy with the lockdowns. Uh, inflation is more or less within the target. Uh, the federal fund rate, as we discussed, is going down and it's not zero, but it's uh, getting very close to zero. Now, as we have the public deficit essentially being showed in, um, in annual values, that value basically plummets to minus 15%. This is the story again shown in a lot closer focus, but what we have here, which is interesting, is what happens afterwards. Inflation, as you can see, the green line now begins to shoot, shoot up way above the, 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 um, the target uh, in which it is supposed to oscillate. Uh, unemployment today, it's uh, very close to the non-cyclical rate of unemployment, but we have an inflation rate of about six, more than 6% in annual terms. And not only that, we have, of course, a much higher uh, public deficit, and we'll be talking about this in a moment. So this public deficit has to be financed somehow. Uh, this is mostly financed through, through, of course, issuing debt. And it's expected that uh, in 2008, back in the Great Recessions, U.S. debt to GDP ratio shoots up, but then it shoots up a lot again. Uh, just before uh, COVID and during COVID, which is what we see in the numbers as well. Now, what happened to productivity? Now, productivity has been sort of like the, the ugly duckling of the story. Nobody talks a lot about it, but productivity in the US, productivity growth, has not been doing so well, both in, in throughout the millennium. Uh, this has been true from the beginning of the millennium, but this is particularly true uh, since the Great Recession. And now, of course, what we see is an even greater impact on productivity growth. I mean, it's, the last numbers are one of the worst for the past 40 years. So my question that sort of permeated all these discussions of the different, uh, different um, stimulus package is why haven't we tried to do something to boost productivity? And where will productivity actually come from uh, in the near to medium term future? So where are we? Well, global fiscal uh, support back in May 2020 was estimated to be about $9 trillion. This is of course much larger, we'll see. Direct budget support around 4.3 trillion. Uh, public sector loans, equity injections, and guarantee around 4.6 trillion. Uh, the U.S. back then stood uh, around 15% of GDP. So this is data coming from the IMF on May 20, 2020. Currently, as we know, these values are significantly larger. I'll show you in the next slide. Essentially, how were this uh, money spent? That depends on the country. For example, uh, China and India invested quite a bit in public health, epidemic prevention and control, tax relief, unemployment insurance. Uh, the US, of course, had a lot uh, on 
very quick disbursement to households and loan guarantees and support to the sub-sovereign. Throughout the story, of course, uh, the monetary uh, policy has been very low, uh, low interest rates. Now, some countries they are trying to pay, they're starting to pick up, um, stimulating this huge liquidity injection in the in the market, and the idea of whatever it takes in terms of monetary to get out of this quote unquote COVID recession. So, what you see in front of you now is the, the um, advanced economies interventions uh, fiscal response to COVID. And you see that the US stands around um, a little bit more than 25% of the US GDP in 2020. So we were talking before um, 15 and now it's above 25. So essentially the current administration, it's pursuing the same policy that the end of the previous administration pursued. Now, how does the future looks may look like in 2021? So inflation, we hear a lot that inflation is temporary, um, solely linked to supply chains, but that I th find it very uh, unlikely. The main reason is that there's too much liquidity for a very short term recession. In other words, back in 2020, I was, issue, I was raising that COVID itself should be short run, but the effects of COVID in terms of the economy may be much longer term. So in my point of view, higher interest rates are li very likely coming. This should have negative impacts on Latin America and developing countries in general, because it's gonna be a lot more expensive to borrow money. Uh, this may also impact tourism in places like Central Florida. And I would like to bring a little bit this uh, closer to home, essentially because as economies devalue their currencies, countries like Brazil depreciate their currencies, it becomes a lot more expensive to travel. And I think that everybody knows here that a overvalued exchange rate does wonders to pay back trips back home. Now, the moral hazard continue, and in fact, uh, was, I would say, a lot more uh, expanded given that uh, you essentially send checks uh, to a lot more people than before. Uh, but, you know, the problem that I have with this is that it seems to me that savers and risk aversion are, has been penalized for a long time in favor of excessive financial risk taking and tax avoidance. And I wonder if this is the society that we want. Inequality. I, again, remain very worried about uh, access and opportunity. Income inequality essentially was, has been tried to address through direct cash payments, which evidently uh, once they run out, they run out. Uh, and I'm still asking myself where, is gonna, where the productivity is gonna, growth is going to come from. Uh, I think that we missed an opportunity to actually have some sort of a condition cash transfer in, um, in lieu of a very quick dispersal mechanisms. So essentially what I'm talking about here is that we could have something like a GI bill of source that essentially pay households to get technically more savvy to invest in their human capital and thereby uh, trying to boost productivity from different sources. This has not been done. And I'm not sure that the current infrastructure bill uh, will do much uh, for this purpose. I don't know much about it. And as far as I know, it's not yet approved, uh, but in the sense of boosting productivity. Uh, the environmental issues, as you probably know, COP26 is happening now. There are amazing technological developments in the past 10 years, making renewable energy, for example, much cheaper, solar, wind, and so on. But uh, this does not necessarily boost productivity. What it does is shift from polluting, at least in the short run, shifts from polluting uh, activities into less polluting activities uh, in the sense of energy production and so on. 
So to conclude, uh, I have to say that the wave is very big and it's strictly and it's changing quite a bit. So how prepared society is to surf it, it may make, big, may make a big difference in avoiding a bad wipeout in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Very, very well spoken. Thank you very much. Let me pass the word now to Dr. John Welch. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Thank you, Dan. That was great. I just, and Paulo. Uh, I did want to say something about Werner quickly. I mean, Werner was incredible. There was not a door that didn't open for me in Latin America uh, throughout my career. Uh, and he, as Eduardo and also um, Paulo said, he really cared for his students and did everything to, to promote them along. So it was really an extraordinary, extraordinary luck because there's, it wasn't any of my doing that I got to work with Warner. And I also got to meet these great economists that are uh, in front of you right now. So let, let me go to my presentation, but just to say one thing about um, inflation in the United States. Um, if I came to the markets in 1993, I was at the Fed of Dallas in 1991. Uh, and uh, that was really the last time we had inflation. And the rate is now above that rate. Uh, and it's, uh, if you think back, if, if you're talking to analysts and economists that only did uh, G3 e uh, economies since then, you would have to be at least 50 years old to know what inflation is. These pa this panel knows it very well, uh, knows inflation quite well, but and not one of them said they thought that inflation was transitory, a word I think should be banned from the English language. So we're gonna see that the pattern that Dan outlined is very similar across Latin America. Uh, but before that, I just wanna give a backup because I learned very early, especially with a very talented economist uh, at the Dallas Fed, that demographics are really important. At the time, people just were sort of shush shushing it. They preferred short-term Keynesian models, especially with exchange rates, real exchange rates. And let me just quickly show you what the backdrop still looks like. Because we know real interest rates. Now, demographics are a real phenomenon. But real interest rates have been falling for quite some time, and now they're quite negative. I haven't updated this, this, uh, this uh graph because I didn't want to bring in the sort of distress situation that we have right now. And you have central banks with very, very low interest, uh, nominal interest rates and inflation spiking. But the demographics were the best way to predict what was going to happen. Uh, at the time in the late 80s, I remember many Latin American country, countries, especially uh, Mexico with Salinas de Gortari, saying we're going to have a lack of capital worldwide and therefore we should start selling assets. And this, the, the demographic models of the world said, no, it's gonna, we're gonna have a savings glut. And that's exactly what we have. So if you're young and aging, you have low savings and high investment. Uh, if you're a middle-aged country, you have high savings and, uh, and increasing and high investment. In that case, you're going to end up with a lot of capital slushing around. Old and aging, the savings starts to decline. Uh, investment is low. So we're sort of right now still in the transition between a middle-aged demographic worldwide and an older one. Latin America is aging very, very fast. Everybody still needs structural reforms. But this was a very good uh, way to explain what was going on with the current accounts of the United States and the rest of the world. At the time, you had people looking at short-term balance of payments questions uh, in the typical Keynesian way, assuming that the United States crisis would come from the balance of payments because we had this big, uh, big um, current account deficit at the time. And we've had, a, it's been shrinking. And then other places like Japan and Europe had huge current account surpluses. And what happened was, is that the rate of return in the United States on capital was much higher than the rest of the world. And we were importing lots of capital and that caused the current account. In other words, when you have a current account uh, uh, surplus, that means that your domestic savings is greater than your investment. And that's where we were uh, 40 years ago. And we're coming to the end of that. The opposite of that was China, 
was young and aging, and then but age is aging like at record speed because of their population um, population policies. I had these huge current account surpluses because their savings was so much higher than uh, than uh, their investment, and they really didn't have any place to put it except in the commercial banking system at the time, and that meant an accumulation of reserves at the central bank. Um, but the, these things are changing as we're as we're aging. I didn't put the you know dependency ratios and things like that. But we have to keep that in mind. The pandemic hit. It has not changed the trends. It wasn't big enough, despite the fact that we had quite a few uh, people pass away and most of, a lot uh, the majority were older. It did not change the sort of demographics uh, tendencies worldwide. So uh, we can sort of keep those there. What it also means is we're going to have re low real interest rates for quite some time, at least until very close to the year 2030. And that's encouraging for emerging markets, especially Latin America. The problem is they have to keep reforming. Now, the two things that come together to show to, to explain why we had low nominal interest rates instead of just real was this demographic movement. And many people on Wall Street, many economists, analysts thought it was purely that, that it was just demographics. We can just print as much money as we want. You know, we got the MM, the monetary, uh, uh, modern monetary theory coming out. We can just keep printing money as we are doing right now. Uh, and that's not, you have, the only way you can do that for a little bit of time is that people believe that the central banks are gonna go back to leaning against inflation. So we all, we had for about 20 years, credible inflation targeting regimes worldwide. And that's why this real interest rate decline translated itself into nominal interest rate decline. It looks like the main central banks, the biggest central banks of the world, even smaller ones, have thrown away that, that anchor. Right now in the United States, as, Eduardo, uh, as uh, Dan went through, the central bank is not leaning against the inflation rate at all. On the contrary, we've learned in Latin America that you have to worry about the secondary and tertiary effects of price increases. And there's absolutely nothing leaning against inflation. And when that happens, inflation is going to stay high, as we've seen the numbers today and Dan show, showed us. Uh, and, um, and, and people will start to lose uh, faith in the central banks. That means credibility goes down. So this is, I think, the explanation for the difference in inflation, what we should see over the future, not what we saw there. As I said, the pattern worldwide was about the same as the United States. And I'll talk about that, how that looked like in Latin America. So just a, I'm not gonna put much on the, on COVID here. We've already seen some graphs of that, uh, but the very best um, the very best way to measure the effects because you know there was big problems with reporting cases, double reporting, it's all done by testing. That has a problem. Then even with deaths, it was very difficult to, to discern whether the primary cause of death was, was, was COVID-19 or was other things uh, like comorbidities, et cetera, because a lot of the people were old. So yes, maybe it was a sort of straw that broke the camel's back, the gota de agua, but the best way to look at it is compare the amount of mortality in current times to what it is normally. And that's what this excess mortality chart shows. And you can see there's definitely very big effects of uh, different phases of this pandemic. But what we've seen is all the Latin American countries, uh, and the United States is right down here, the excess mortality has dropped to almost zero. Uh, yes, people die every day from a number of causes. So if it's because of COVID, you would have a, a, an inordinate number of mortality. And right now things look quite encouraging and across the board in Latin America. Uh, now if you look at vaccinations across the board in Latin America, very good. You know, now the United States has fallen back or Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, all ahead of, uh, of the United States, the United Kingdom. Mexico's not very far behind with 58%. And the world is at 51%. So arguing that Latin America was, at, or any specific country was laggard in this, it was only a question of time before they caught up, especially those countries that are much better at putting in place um, vaccinations like Chile and Brazil. And that's also encouraging for the future. And what we should keep in mind is that this is a purely external shock. So we saw a lot of the US economists comparing the recovery in 2020 and 2021 to what happened after 2008, which is completely inappropriate as far as I can say. Brazil is a better place. In fact, the, the, the rhyming is a little bit closer because 
Brazil had a, a completely external shock in 2008 and grew, was going to grow at a, you know, a good rate in 2010, but then the government put in a whole bunch of stimulus on top of it and they got to a Bojigalinha. They got to something that was completely unsustainable. I remember being in arguments and my forecast for US growth was 3.5 and uh, for Brazil it was 3.5, excuse me. And then it came in at 7.5 and they thought I was being too optimistic. So clearly that putting massive amounts of stimulus on a recovery that's full blown is problematic. And we see that and uh, again, outline those risks very well. So if you look at uh, all of Latin America, even the ones that we consider not as, um, not as market friendly like Argentina and Venezuela, although we don't have data for Venezuela, they just really are poor on that anymore. And they just stop publishing a number of series. You can see the recovery is a V in each one of these. It's really a question of arithmetic. Uh, if you stop walking to start again, you, your, your, your percentage change is gonna be very, very high because the base is lower, et cetera. Uh, and if you don't, the biggest thing, the reason that you can't compare this to the 2008 in the United States is in 2008, the, the US banking system was in the trash. It was compromised, it's no longer that way. And that's the only thing that inhibits a V. If you don't have a functioning financial market and you can see all the countries here in 2021 are gonna show very, very high um, growth rates. I think someone's trying to get me to renew my car, get warranty, excuse me, just one second. Um, anyway, so you can see even uh, Argentina, even Ecuador, you know, the smaller countries tend to show bigger uh, recoveries, Peru, et cetera. And you can see inflation really spiked here in all the countries, not in Argentina because they're already there. They're already having huge supply constraints because of uh, the, many of the policies they were put in place. And you know, Venezuela had a 13 million percent uh, inflation rate in 2018. It's now down to a very uh, reasonable 1,081 per year. Uh, I'm being facetious, of course. Brazil has a spike. Uh, there's something else that, that we'll see also, and Brazil is a very good example. In all the countries, this inflation is purely tradable goods. Uh, not purely, but the non-tradable goods sector, which is what monetary policy should be looking at, are much more modest. We see that in Chile, we see it in Brazil, we see it in Colombia, we see it in, even in Argentina. The non-tradable, the services part inflation has not caught up. And that's, that's a different thing for Latin America. The exchange rate and commodity price increases have made the headline inflation very high, but this more core type inflation has, not, has been slow to catch up. And what that means is the exchange rates are really weak, which also bodes well for growth over the next couple of years. I won't go through this in Brazil, but it, we're seeing something we've never seen before. And it, it, a lot of people are scratching their heads as how could this possibly be? So um, the policy rates in all the countries dropped to very low levels. And the question is, are the central banks behind the curve with these spikes? Especially in light of the next slide we'll, we'll show uh, is uh, the fiscal side. You can see the countries that have shown very good recovery. Brazil's recovery is really extraordinary in this regard. And so is Ecuador. Ecuador doesn't run very big deficits usually, only when they're in sort of crisis mode. Uh, Colombia is a little bit more worrisome. Uh, and Peru, Peru is really, they go from uh, significant deficits to no deficits whatsoever. Uh, that is if the politics sustain that. So uh, we have, Macro policy, as I said, also the policy rates, the central banks are leaning against the wind. They're already tightening, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and they're leaning against the wind with fiscal policy, the exact opposite of what's going in the United States. We have loose monetary policy has not tightened. It's still for, they're still buying bonds and fiscal policy, as you know, as Dan showed is huge, the expansionary. Debt to GDP. Uh, many people say, oh, that's out of control and stuff like that. Of course, in Argentina, especially with the weakness, uh, the strength in the dollar, that tends to you know, reduce GDP in dollar terms. So you have these big ratios and, and Argentina is still in default and they're negotiating with the IMF and I don't know how those are going to go. But everyone thought that Brazil would be above 100%. I use net debt, but gross debt is only in the low 80s. And it's really, uh, it, that is affected directly by the exchange rate because you don't net out reserves. So I've netted those out here and I've done the same with Mexico. Uh, 
these debt to GDP ratios are mostly manageable. The only place where it's a places where it's a little bit concerning uh, is Colombia and Ecuador. But Ecuador is not traditionally as fiscally responsible as Colombia. But Colombia, uh, and we'll talk about the politics in a moment. But the direction there is not so good. But we've had some very good improvement. Some of it just comes naturally with the recovery, such as in Argentina. Uh, uh, with the fiscal side here, you're going to see there's an improvement in the nominal deficit in Argentina, and that will stabilize, but that is purely off the recovery. And as we'll talk about in a moment, uh, they're wanting to spend that revenue recovery right away. So, and finally, uh, we had a huge improvement in current accounts across the board. Why? Because of higher commodity prices, big positive shock in terms of trade. And in terms of the flow external uh, uh, accounts, they're very good. So this also reflects weakness in the, in the economy, which is not quite so positive. So these two years are political years, although 2020 was also a political year in some countries. Argentina just had their primary in September. It, it went against uh, the coalition of uh, Alberto Fernandez and Kirchner, which has made people a little bit uh, optimistic about the direction of Argentina at least after another two years when they have the next presidential election. The, the, the election, uh, the midterm election is uh, in November, November uh, 14th, but it's uh, pretty much a, uh, I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment, uh, pretty much a formality. Mexico had their June, uh, their congressional and gubernatorial elections in June of this year. Then we have presidential elections, some of which we've already had. Ecuador was in February, they elected Guillermo Lasso, a leftward leaning uh, president. Peru uh, elected uh, uh, also a leftward leaning, leaning president, Pedro Castillo. Colombia uh, will have presidential and general elections next year. Things are not looking good for the more conservative side of the ticket. Uh, Brazil has its general elections uh, next year and Chile does also. Uh, I'm not gonna comment about Brazil's election. It's more neutral in terms of where we're going and it's a bit or too early. Chile's looks a little different. And again, we're getting this, we're getting a alert to the left, or I would call less market-friendly policies or heterodox policies in countries that were traditionally very uh, conservative and orthodox. So let's look quickly at Argentina. We have uh, this Sunday, the, the election. Everything showed that uh, in the, Argentina has very strange primaries. That there, everybody votes in the primary, it's an open primary. So it's just like having the election. So usually, you don't, and it was in September, you have two months between September and uh, the November elections, not much changes. So Juntos para el Cambio, uh, and who was really dominated by Horacio Rodriguez Larreta not, and not Mauricio Macri, he wasn't quite, but they made major inroads and it doesn't look like they're gonna turn around. The ruling Frente de Todos, FDT, which is Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Kirchner, is very poorly and they're always, they're polling very badly in the surveys. Uh, the reaction by the government, you would think that they would listen to what the voters are saying. They're not happy with the inflation outcome, with the, you know, using uh, uh, you know, price controls, limiting foreign exchange, et cetera. But it looks like the current government's going to double down on those policies to try to subsidize a re-election in two years. And that's a problem. So Argentina is headed for, a, uh, for some, very turbulent times. I had dinner with four Argentines. They were all in unison. They are not recommending anybody buy, uh, uh, in general, Argentine assets, at first, except for a couple bonds that look interesting in a restructure. Mexico. So uh, AMLO, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, is the president. The elections uh, were mixed. We don't really know. Morena won. But it, had a, it has a slimmer margin of majority in Congress than it did after the elections three years ago. Uh, AMLO has three more years. And he's continuing, but very slowly, in a very Gramscian way, uh, undoing the reforms that date back to the 1980s. He's undoing the reforms in Pemex. He's reinstituting the, the, the monopoly that Pemex has. He's suspended a number of initiatives. Uh, he can't do many of them because they were they were done by constitutional reform, but he's doing it uh, sort of around the bend. And also we're seeing that also uh, the undoing of market liberalization, electricity generation distribution. And he's 
clearly pushing to perpetuate himself in power that we saw his uh, friend um, Zalaya in, in Honduras try to do a number of years ago. Uh, and we've seen just recently in Nicaragua, uh, sort of a trend and, and Chavez, of course, in, in Maduro and Venezuela. Um, the one saving grace of AMLO is that he's a fiscal conservative and he has not allowed the fiscal accounts to get out of whack. The new uh, finance minister is excellent, uh, Rogelio Ramiro de la Hoa, but you know, I think it was almost a surprise that he was named. So uh, we'll see how they, they do on that. But Mexico doesn't look great and it's slow. It's already moved quite a bit left and it's slipping further than one. And Ecuador, uh, we like the Guillermo Lasso, uh, Gustavo Lasso, excuse me, I have that typo, facing, he's facing allegations of offshore legal accounts. He has a major heterodox labor and tax reform bill in Congress that was rejected at the committee level. So it's gonna be very difficult for him to put it through. He and his party are trying to push it uh, uh, through a referendum. He went on tour after when it was kind of difficult, uh, but uh, he's now back and he's being blocked by the Congress in terms of these very, very heterodox initiatives. He's still going to try to do stuff by the populist way of using by referendum, but so far it would be unconstitutional for him to try to do some of these initiatives in by referendum. In Peru, another left-leaning can, uh, candidate, one Pedro Castillo. He's an admirer of Chavez, Perón, Castro. He's trying to push constitutional reform to, so they can per perpetuate himself, or at least his coalition party, Peru Libre, uh, Libre in, 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 who's in power. Uh, he, had this, he had to reshuffle his cabinet, although he was only elected a little bit ago, uh, because the extreme left is, is squabbling with the moderate left. They're trying to go whole hog on these constitutional reforms that very much emulate what happened in Venezuela. Uh, they, against uh, Castillo's wishes, Peru Libre is collecting signatures to push these constitutional reforms by referendum. And his, popul his popularity is very negative. He has a negative net evaluation, Castillo, because the, uh, of what, you know, Ecuadorians are much more conservative than this. The, eco the economy, uh, is on autopilot. I mean, excuse me, Peruvians are much more conservative. We had this very strong conservative consensus in Peru, where that's why they had very low fiscal deficits and very low inflation for many years. Luckily, Julio Velarde is still at the at the central bank, solidly controlled monetary policy, and he will lean against anything uh, that comes out of the, out of the treasury. Uh, and the credit agencies have all either put uh, Peru on downward watch or have downgraded them. Uh, they had an excellent, probably they had better, uh, they were just as good as, as Chile and certainly the change that happened through Peru over the last couple of years is amazing. Um, then we have Colombia general elections and presidential elections next year. President Duque is really in trouble with his, his popularity, et cetera. It lost uh, because the fiscal side, he has not been able to push through a tax reform uh, and trying to control the fiscal side. It cost our former colleague at Illinois, Econ Economy Minister Alberto Carrasquilla, his job. Gustavo uh, Petro, another, you know, sort of Chavez lookalike is, is leading the polls. And they're already pushing to dismantle the, the pension system. Chile and Peru, uh, uh, Colombia and Peru followed Chile in its, uh, in its pension reform and have very vibrant, fully funded uh, pension systems. They are pushing to dismantle that. In fact, it already has started because they've they've allowed during this uh, uh, Duque has allowed during this pandemic uh, many people to take up to fifty percent of their savings out of the system, which is going to make leave the system underfunded, especially with demographics. So they're moving back towards a pay-as-you-go social security system, and it's quite concerning. Chile, also a place of concern, although they're starting in a wonderful spot. Uh, Gustavo Boric and Jose Antonio Cast are leading in the polls for the presidential elections next year. We've already started seeing a restructuring of their pension system as well with withdrawals going on. Uh, and heterodox economic policies are gaining weight for the first time since the 1970s. So, you know, some rather more orthodox Chilean economists are saying they're going back to the, you know, early 1970s uh, in terms of the direction. So the direction there is also a bit concerning. 
market funding reforms are still needed. And it looks like Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, and Peru are starting moving towards heterodoxy. It depends upon what the median voter and the median voter in these countries in the main are much more center right. And we'll see if that, that march to heterodoxy will be stopped. Yeah, those who went down that road are suffering more, and, and are, were there are some signs that we may see a reversal. Certainly, the primaries in Argent or the elections on Sunday in Argentina, and even in Venezuela, they're negotiating with the opposition. So we'll see what happens there. The only real moderate country, I mean, Mexico is not as extreme as those, so I, I couldn't figure out where to put them. Brazil and Mexico are, are failing relatively well, but uh, they have to continue with reform. So. Uh, let me just quickly go through the, the Brazilian case and then I'll stop. Um, I'm just going to let the data speak for itself. I'm not going to talk about politics. It's way too early to figure that out. We don't even know who the candidates are yet. So um, certainly Brazil's infection and mortality trajectory is, is on the decline. And it's been on the decline for some time. If you read the international newspapers, it, you wouldn't get that idea. You would think that uh, Brazil, you know, COVID is out of control, et cetera. Uh, I, I, don't think I'm going to reproduce this here. Brazil has vaccinated well over 70% of its population. Uh, and that's ahead of, as I showed before, ahead of uh, many regions. Growth is recovering quickly. We've seen this, you know, Vs, the rubber band effect uh, in every country, right? The further, the, the rubber band effect is, the harder you pull down on a rubber band, the faster it's, it's, it snaps back. It's sort of that arithmetic uh, thing. It's not really even forecasting. And we're not quite being uh, governed by fundamentals other than the banking system. We've had an inflation spike, but again, as I said, especially in Brazil, non-tradable goods inflation is still much lower than headline, uh, which is the main one that the central bank needs to work. Anticipating non-tradable goods price pressure, the Banco Central do Brasil is tightening, and we're seeing uh, monetary conditions very tight already, and I'll show you that quickly. Fiscal accounts have improved significantly. We have a uh, year-on-year -year primary deficit of 0.63% of GDP. That's incredible because it got up to about 10%. Uh, and net debt and gross debt ratios have declined. Some people are arguing that they're going to be temporary, but those are the same economists that argue that this would, we wouldn't be get what we're getting right now. So we'll see how this, it really depends upon. Uh, this, as I said, this also implies that the real exchange rate is very weak. We've never seen this before. And then we have the turbulence from next year's election. So here's the V's. They first are V's up and then they're V down. So, uh, you know, on average, Brazil is recovering pretty well in 12 months. And then we, this is the GDP numbers, you know, it's up to the second quarter, but we're still sort of getting uh, those. Certainly we're gonna get a, a, a drop in the V, but you know, back to kind of reasonable growth rates. At least these are my forecasts. I call them guesses because we're still guessing a little bit here. Um, this is the real, clincher here. Brazil has had this massive terms of trade shock, almost as big as what happened after the 2000, uh, the recovery of, from the 2008 crisis. That then you had this massive increase in exports and not as much in imports. 40% of Brazilian imports are commodities. A lot of people only look at the commodities, but Brazil imports a lot of commodities. So typically when commodities go up, as you can see here, when you have both import and export prices moving together, the effects, 60% of exports are linked to, uh, to commodities. So you get a mild improvement, nothing like this. This was explosive. And I've narrowed it down oddly enough to fertilizer prices. The world had, had stockpiles of fertilizer and Brazil's a big importer of fertilizer. And that's why you did not get the accompanying here. But here, this it's really hard to explain this. This is a huge terms of trade shot. We only see, be able to figure out exactly why it's happening, but it's happened. But when that happens, typically the real, the real real uh, gets stronger. And now it's not. You can see I have the inverse uh, axis for the terms of trade, and here's the real dollar real. And you can see typically when the terms of trade goes down up, then the real gets stronger. And when the terms of trade goes down, it gets weaker. And here we have a very weak real with very strong terms of trade. Uh, some are arguing it's because the central bank is not tight enough. I don't think so. I don't, that's not my opinion. I don't agree with that. But we'll see. This is a hard one because I've never seen this before in my career. So this is quite something. And of course, what comes with it are, is, you know, we're down to zero current account balance, as I showed before. FDI is starting to recover. That was the main thing that got hit during the pandemic. Uh, 
But portfolio flows are very strong. It's mostly in the uh, fixed income, but good strong uh, flows there. And as I said, inflation is rising. Headline inflation through October was 10.67%. These other measures of core, which I don't particularly like, the trim mean and the exclusion core, I don't, you know, there's information in those prices. In trim mean, you don't have the same set of prices in, in every month. So uh, I like to look at non-tradables and, and service inflation. You can see uh, tradables inflation is massive because of the rise in commodity prices and the, the rise in the dollar. But we still have non-tradable and services kind of, you know, they're below 6%, not much, but and services are even lower and that's not bad. And the central bank is already tightening in advance. You can see that uh, I used to always, I always look at the average between the, the subsidized uh, interest rate and the CELIC to really figure out if you're gonna use an interest rate, and it used to be that, of course, the TLP and the TJLP were way below the CELIC. So trying to get the average rate up, you really had to jam the CELIC a lot. I think looking at the CELIC is illusory. But now we have this very strange, since we saw, starting with Tamar and then with this administration, that the TL, TJ, effective TJLP is above the CELIC rate. So the average uh, base rate is, is above, and it's almost 10%. So I don't think that they're, and they're tightening against this and trying to lean against non-tradables, I don't think we're going to get the kind of uh, increases in the Savik that many are forecasting. And you can see I have a family of Taylor rules here, depending upon what you assume the equilibrium real rate is. And they're definitely, they're, they're chasing it a bit, but they're definitely in the tight zone, depending upon your assumption about the neutral rate. And you can see now, look, this is, this is uh, M1, M, excuse me, monetary base gross, it's negative year on year through uh, October. And the same thing here, you can see credit growth is starting to level off. So monetary conditions are not only tightening, but they are tight. And here's that fiscal accounts. And maybe we've gotten this, the green line is the INSS uh, Social Security. We've seen some recovery. Maybe it's the reform. Could be just a recovery in receipts. We'll see. But you can see the primary balance is just below zero. And now was following. This is extraordinary. This is so much better than even optimistic people like me had forecasted. Debt GDP, gross debt continues to go up, but they are moving, you know, gross debt into general government debt. It's going up, but it, it's it's been stable for a little bit, and certainly we're well below 100%, which many people thought we were going to be 120, 130. I don't know why that color is that way. I apologize for that. And then finally, this is the, this is why, you know, especially the credibility of net debt has gone back, but the black line is for, for an exchange reserves. The red line is total foreign debt, not including intercompany debt. And the green line is the government's debt. The government has about a hundred, um, about a hundred billion dollars in excess dollar assets. So when the dollar rises, the government gains and debt to GDP goes down. It's, it's for every 1%, 10% uh, rise in dollar real, uh, that net debt to GDP goes down by about one percentage point, and that's huge. So people that worry about the exchange rate being weak, it's actually helping the government quite a bit, and it's helping exporters. So finally, let me just sum up and, and hand it back to Eduardo. Significant fiscal recovery in the unprecedented financial market price action owes much to three fiscal rules, especially the spending cap. And this is where we get a little bit worried. Sorry about the market. market. The decision to extend the Brazil to Brazil to 400 per month threatens that cap. And that's, that hurts. I mean, uh, it hurts credibility. Although we're still getting these very good outcomes, these outturns. Uh, but is that the real threat? The real threat I would argue is the growing wage bill and the lack of administrative reform, giving an extra 100 reais per month to people that are still struggling with the pandemic doesn't seem, and that's, that's the pro political problem here is that you can't just cut the wage bill. And that's going to be a problem after all this is over. Uh, it means also that uh, continued fiscal prudence is going to be a lot of work. It's going to make this more difficult. This is all complicated by next year's election. Monetary policy is tightening how much is needed. Some argue a lot more. I don't argue that. Uh, and we have this persistent real depreciation in the, in the real, which is something that if you try to do it by force, all you get is inflation and it doesn't get weaker in real terms. So, 
Um, and then the final question, I think Dan was talking about the United States in this, will Brazil return to better long-term growth? This is still an open question, but I'll have to say with all the noise, et cetera, this, the government continues to push the reform. They're auctioning off uh, concessions and ask, we'll still have the Petrobras thing, maybe even in an election year, uh, Letrobras. The idea of sell, uh, privatizing Petrobras is now on the table, which I never thought would happen. It may be problematic politically, but you know, I'm still pretty constructive about the way things are going. It has nothing to do with the political actors. It has to do with mainstream, I guess, median voter result. They are conservative. They want low inflation, et cetera. And the governments have to attend to that at, to their own peril. Thank you. Obrigado. Gracias. That's it for me. And second. John, thank you very much. A very comprehensive uh, overview of Latin America. Highly appreciate it. Thank you. Let's uh, switch gears now to Europe and its view on the crisis in Latin America. Just to recap, the Professor Paulo Tenani is replacing today uh, uh, Antonio Nogueira Leite, who could not attend due to personal reasons. Go ahead, Paulo. Uh, thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak uh, after Dan Biller talking about the U.S. and John Welsh giving such a comprehensive view uh, of Latin America. I'm going to stress that uh, I'm covering for my friend, uh, Antonio Nogueira Leite, who is European and knows about Europe, is more knowledgeable about Europe than I am. But I do have some uh, opinions. I'm very opinionated and I'm going to share uh, these opinions uh, with you. I have prepared the presentation. Just give me a second, and I'm going to share it. So here it is. Uh, Well, when looking, uh, uh, and I want to stress uh, the differences between what has been being done in Europe over the past 20 years with what has been done in the US uh, over the past 20 years and try to see where Latin American fits in and how, what we can learn from these very different uh, policy experiments, the one in Europe and uh, the one uh, in the US. Since 2008, uh, and especially now after the COVID crisis, uh, Europeans and Americans have had a very different approach. Americans have been much more aggressive uh, in the use of fiscal and monetary policy to fight the crisis. It happened in 2008. It happened again uh, now with the COVID crisis. Uh, and this has a lot of costs and a lot of benefits that I want to compare and, and to see if we can find a lesson uh, for us here at Latin America. For instance, uh, monetary policy, was, uh, when we look at M2, which is a monetary aggregate, has been much easier, much easier in the US than in Europe. Uh, the rate of growth of monetary policy of this monetary aggregate since 2008 in the US, it has been 8.24% a year. This is huge. Uh, we are gonna see a chart uh, very soon showing that th this is a major increase uh, in, uh, in the rate of growth of this monetary aggregate compared to what it was 10 years before uh, the great recession crisis in 2008. Uh, on the fiscal side, the US has be also been very aggressive. We are talking about primary deficits that since 2008 have averaged 5.14% of GDP. Uh, Dan Biller showed that now uh, after the COVID crisis, we are talking about uh, a fiscal primary deficit in the US that summing what has been done during the COVID, which uh, the US is still doing uh, in 2001, 2002, we are talking about a primary deficit of two. 22%, 25% of GDP, which is half of it, what, what it was in 1945, a war period. Uh, 
Uh, in the Eurozone, um, policy response were much more timid. M2 expanded at a rate of 3.13% per year. Uh, while we didn't have a primary deficit over uh, the last 13 years since 2008, we actually had a primary surplus on average of 0.31% of GDP. So these were two very different policy experiments with the US uh, using uh, a large dose of fiscal and monetary uh, stimulus, whereas Europe, whenever it needed, uh, uh, eased monetary policy and fiscal policy. But when you look at this 13 year, year period, uh, they were very conservative on monetary and fiscal policies. We can see this in a chart. And here we have Latin America, uh, the blue chart, uh, it deals with the data from 2008 to 2021. So it's the COVID crisis and the Great Recession crisis. Uh, and uh, the orange uh, chart uh, is dealing about the 10, uh, talking about more showing data regarding the 10 years before uh, the COVID crisis. And you see that uh, monetary aggregates in Europe, uh, monetary policy has actually been tighter than it was uh, during the 19s and before the Great Recession crisis. Uh, in the US, we had a, uh, a very easy monetary policy with the rate of growth of M2 more than doubling. And in Latin America, uh, the US actually has. Uh, reached uh, a monetary expansion that is similar to what Latin America has now. Uh, but in Latin America, compared to the 10 years uh, before uh, the Great Recession, uh, policy, uh, monetary policy has actually been tighter. Here we have fiscal policy. Uh, Europe, uh, from 1997 from to 2008, uh, had a small deficit, a small primary deficit. And since 2008, despite the many crises, it has moved to a small surplus. In the US, we had huge uh, primary deficits before, and now they have been even higher. And in Latin America, we have moved to primary surpluses to primary deficits. As you can see, both in terms of monetary policy and fiscal policy, Latin America is somewhere between uh, the European exper experiment, uh, the Euro area experiment, and the US uh, experiment. Let's now look at the benefits or, and the costs of these different approaches. As expected, the US, with aggressive fiscal and monetary policy, grew faster than Europe, 2.27% per year compared to 1.6% per, uh, per year for the Eurozone. When you compare uh, these rates of growth with what happened before, uh, the 10 years before the Great Recession, you see that the US sharply decelerated despite the fiscal and monetary efforts, and Europe also decelerated. Uh, we also have uh, inflation. Inflation has been declining uh, both in Europe and the US, despite the huge fiscal and monetary stimulus. Uh, this is evidence of the great deflationary forces that the global economy is now facing. Uh, when you look at employment, US employment actually deteriorated a bit, despite the fiscal and monetary efforts. And in Europe, it remained fairly constant. Uh, here we can compare with Latin America. You see the major deceleration in the US, uh, the deceleration in Europe, and an even bigger uh, economic growth deceleration in Latin America uh, uh, from uh, 2008 and uh, uh, 2021 and before that, the 10 years that precede uh, the Great Recession. Now let's look at the costs. I mean, we had the benefits of uh, growth that did not decelerate that much uh, in the US and Europe, major decelerations despite uh, the fiscal uh, and monetary st stimulus, um, but it could be having even worse. Uh, 
if it were not for them. Now let's look at the costs. Uh, and the major costs is the US debt to GDP ratio and the European debt to GDP ratio. Uh, the US debt to GDP ratio increased by 50, 50, 55 percentage points to 100% of GDP. It's now moving to 110% of GDP from 45% of GDP in 2007. Uh, in Euro, there was also a huge increase uh, in the debt to GDP ratio, but only by only by 30 percentage points, on average to 83% of GDP from 53% in 2007. We are going to compare this with what happened in Latin America uh, and the fiscal, uh, the increase in the debt to GDP ratio was much smaller in Latin America than in what happened in Europe and in the US. And inflation continued to be very low. Actually, it became even lower despite the huge fiscal stimulus, despite uh, the huge uh, uh, increase in the monetary aggregates. Uh, John Welsh mentioned that uh, you, uh, real rates continue to be uh, very negative and have been declining uh, both in the US and in Europe. Uh, once again, this is evidence of the major deflationary, deflationary forces that uh, the global economy is facing. Uh, increase in the debt to GDP ratio of this magnitude in normal economic times should uh, result in a large increase in real interest rates, and interest rates have been declining over this period. Here we see uh, the huge increases in the debt to GDP ratio, uh, Europe. 28 percentage points compared to a decline of four percentage point in the 10 years before the Great Recession. US, a huge 50 uh, uh, percentage points increase to 100% of GDP uh, compared to an increase of 11% of GDP in the 10 years before 2008. And this is what happened in Latin America, an increase of 23% of, of GDP in the debt to GDP ratio compared to a, a minor increase during the 1997-2008 uh, uh, period. So this is evidence of two very different uh, economic approaches uh, to the challenges that uh, the global economy has been facing over the past 13 years. Europe was much more, much more conservative in the use of fiscal policy and monetary policy, the US were very much aggressive. Latin America has uh, been in the middle. And the question that we have to ask is, was it wise to be in the middle? Uh, was it wise to follow uh, what the US has done, uh, aggressive fiscal or monetary policies? Or would, would we be better uh, following the European, the Eurozone approach with more restrictive, and more um, uh, monetary and fiscal policy. I have to say that Brazil, uh, the Latin America region actually follow a path that is very similar to what the United Kingdom has followed, uh, a middle ground. And the question I leave to you, I have an opinion about it, but I, I will leave the answer to each of you, is uh, if it was wise for Latin America uh, to be in the middle uh, rather than using a very aggressive fiscal and monetary policy, and as it happened in the US, or a very conservative fiscal and monetary policy, as it happened uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, that's it from my side. Uh, Eduardo, your turn. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Paulo Tenani. Very nice perspectives on, on Europe. Oh, I would like to open up for questions. If all the participants would like to send me out questions, I'll be glad to pass on to the, to the panelists. I have actually a couple questions already that I received. Let me start one to uh, John Welsh. Okay. Uh, John. We have seen a turn to the left in Latin America. Even in more traditionally conservative countries, 
that is taking place. To what extent is this due to China's influence and investment in the region? Some may say that China will own Latin America very soon. Thank you. And thank you for that question. Thank you. you know, I have no inside information. I mean, certainly China is, is uh, investing very heavily. They started in the Caribbean because they really need to have a port that they can access through the Panama Canal. Uh, how much influence that China has in this is really hard to say because the main impetus came from Cuba uh, in all of this. So, uh, and also partially from Brazil. So how much do the Chinese have um, in every place in Latin America? You had, uh, you know, after the Berlin Wall fell, you had a strategy among different left-leaning politicians to follow a, a Gramscian effort. And we saw that in Honduras, we saw it in Nicaragua, we saw it in, in Mexico as well. We're starting to see it now in Colombia, Chile, and Peru. And it's after having, you know, for years having a consensus on the Orthodox side. So I suspect that uh, China has a bigger influence because the amount of trade that those three countries do with China is much bigger than the East Coast, the West Coast has it. But I have no, uh, I, don't, I don't have a good answer on terms of exactly what they're doing. I know they're investing. They usually invest in a way that isn't very integrating to, uh, to the countries they invest in. They usually bring their own workers et cetera. I know Ecuador, they put a lot of money in oil because they need oil and in Venezuela. How much, and Peru has oil. Uh, they, you know, they're basically out there for commodities, but to, to explain all, you know, a huge amount of the change, it, it's hard to, I think possibly it has to do with this sort of middle income trap. I mean, these many, these three countries are quite well to do, especially Chile. And I think some of the demonstrations we saw from, from, I don't want to say coddled, but um, middle class students, et cetera, demanding free this and you know education, et cetera. I think that it may have it may it may there may be some opportunistic Chinese meddling, but I think this is sort of homegrown at this point. Thanks, John. Before I leave you, I have one question for Dan, but we'll back to you, John, just to, to wrap this up. Uh, there is a question that just came in here now about Brazil um, abandoning of its uh, industrialization program and, and shifting more towards uh, services. Is this too early to do that? And is this driven uh, by uh, local uh, policies and and the pandemics, meaning we are jumping, we're, we're leaving behind, Brazil is leaving behind its, its industrial uh, you know, sector, abandoning to some, to some extent and moving too quickly to, uh, to services and, and subsidies. I would argue that uh, the policies that supposedly protected Brazilian industry actually did them much harm. And that's the protect, trade protectionism. So we saw this, when, when uh, the Brazilian government, along with Argentina, increased the common external tariff in Mercosul in about 2014, uh, 2013, 2012, 2013, what happened was they put the increased tariffs on capital goods, which fund investment. So where you have big problems in Brazilian industry is that they cannot import the latest technology, they cannot import uh, the machinery that encapsulates that latest technology. And they only think of the external protectionism against direct trade. Uh, and, it, you know, this, this no longer works for Brazil. And this is uh, probably also you have a very weak exchange rate. How can uh, it's giving huge protection to Brazilian industry and it's stagnating? This means you've had years and years of subsidizing inefficient industries. And Brazil really needs to open up unilaterally at this point, waiting to bilaterals, et cetera. I don't think is the way to go. All right. Okay. And uh, now uh, to uh, let's shift to Dan Biller on the U.S. economy, and again, touching on China. So, Dan, the U.S. administration has been perceived to be weak on China. 
what type of economic pressure will China likely exert to squeeze the U.S. out of its economic dominance? Keep in mind that China is the second largest non-U.S. holder of U.S. Treasury after Japan. Okay, uh, I worked in China from uh, from um, 2003 to 2007, and uh, even though times are very different, uh, I think that it's quite interesting uh, what has happened and what's happening in China. In fact, uh, there was change with Xi Jinping, but essentially. Uh, my view is that China is essentially open for business, has been open for business since Deng Xiaoping uh, came and said that uh, it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white, what it matters is that it catches mice. Uh, so my point of view, including even in the previous question, is that China has... Um, Essentially, it's less interested in influencing, let's say, the politics of a place, but it's very interested in interesting in, in having economic ties with the place. And not only economic ties for commodities purpose, even though this is the main target, but also for lending money, because they are able to lend money without, uh, without too much uh, concerns linked to, to um, human rights and so on. Now, the question becomes, there are some countries that own 10% of GDP to China. Nowadays, what's going to happen when they don't have money to pay, right? In the case of the U.S., uh, you know, with all the concern about uh, trade, which I personally think that um, you know, the trade inter interventions do not make, make much sense, and with all the concerns of uh, how much China owns in terms of uh, U.S. debt, which has been going significantly down because interest rates are so low. I think that there is something that, uh, that goes uh, to the U.S. that it doesn't go to China. And it's a big problem that China will have to solve. We have to remember that um, the Communist Party of China loves the market as long as the market does what it wants. If the market starts to do what it doesn't want, it will not like the market so much. What I mean by that is what it has going for the U.S. is essentially the power of its market to promote innovation and therefore in the long term to promote um, productivity growth. Uh, China has to sort of be able to find and solve that issue that uh, it holds for its future. There's going to be a point with aging population and so on, they will have to find a way that uh, stimulates innovation and that mainly means markets and freedoms work. Eduardo, can I just say or just follow up on you want to say something? Okay. Just, this goes back to, you know, the, the, the demographics that I was talking about a little bit. And I remember the same discussion during the 2008 uh, crisis. First, uh, they're aging. They're aging at a rate that we've never seen in history. Why? Because they had, con you know, they controlled their people to one child, one family, one child. And even those habits, although they've rescinded that, are hard to break. And that means as a country, they are aging very fast. And that means that their savings rate is dropping relative to investment. And a lot of the investment is being propped up the way the other Asian countries did uh, in stuff that's not necessarily very productive, like real estate for now. So uh, it's natural that they would start getting rid of their, you know, their current account surpluses are nowhere near what they used to be. And they, they, in fact, at some point, you'd expect them to lose some of their reserves. The second thing is that we heard, oh, let's, they're going to abandon investing in U.S. treasuries and not use the dollar. Well, I think that's, if, if, although they put in a lot of financial reforms and Chinese, the Chinese population has more access to financial uh, uh, assets, it's still the central bank is a fiduciary. It's like a trust. Why would the central bank come and sell a bunch of bonds and, 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 and suffer a huge capital loss uh, just because they're mad at the United States? That doesn't read because they're going to, they're shooting off their nose to, to spite their face. So I, I think the risk on that of something that 
serious is quite low because they would be hurting themselves massively. Very good point. Add to this, uh, just because I have a very interesting story that happened back then in 2004 or five, uh, when we would talk to the Chinese government about their pension problems, right? Because as John says, uh, population is aging and so on, uh, and they will fall in the same pension problems that all the aging population countries uh, have. And the answers were uh, essentially, well, look, if we go at six to 8% a year, People will just work until they die. They don't need to go on uh, on uh, and retire, right? And essentially, you can do it, but you need to have ways of having innovation and productivity growth, which for me is less clear how the Chinese are going to solve that equation. Very interesting. I think we have time for one more question. It just came in now in our uh, panel, in our Slido for about Venezuela. So to John, uh, contrary to predictions, Maduro is still in power. Inflation, as you pointed out, is at 3,000% heading to a moderate 1,000% next year. In your opinion, is Venezuela heading to total collapse or that's the new norm? Uh, yeah, it's hard to say that it isn't already in total collapse. Um, here's the problem, and this is a problem, this has been a problem for a long time. The opposition is fragmented. And as long as the opposition is fragmented, you will not get a change in power. And that's been a policy that's been directly put in place by both Chavez and Maduro with the coaching of the folks in Cuba, I would say. Um, and, and repression works, unfortunately. Uh, as we've seen in other countries. Uh, but at some point, you know, a country that had a very traditional history of the democracy or some form of democracy, much more participatory than this, it's hard to see them uh, staying in this particular equilibrium. It's not a very, it's, it's kind of a stable local equilibrium, but not a long-term equilibrium because their, their, their production of oil is just, it's like, 20, 10 to 20 percent of what it used to be. That's the main thing they do. And they're not developing anything else. Uh, their fiscal accounts are in such mass disarray uh, that at some point, you know, someone is going to decide. And we heard some of this discussion actually from the Maduro government about privatizing some of their, their petroleum assets to people that could actually manage something. So it, it's a very sad story. Uh, and, you know, at some point, We'll get that change, but typically, as Albert Hirschman pointed out, you get change when things are getting better, not when they're at, you're at the work and things are not getting better in Venezuela. Very good. I will pass the word now to Professor Paulo Tanani for the, his final remarks. Well, thank you very much for uh, watching this sixth edition of uh, Humus da America Latina. Uh, and see you next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also. Thanks, folks. <laughs>